Told me to close our research center, so that's sort of sucks. Well, is that right? Are you seeing patients? Or do you have a lot of stuff? Yeah, they asked me when we were going to make 25% return on investment. I said that would be never. You know, I used to say, you know, when Bob was he did about too much better. He was oh, sure. amazing. Sure. Yeah. That's how he made a living. So, and one time we had uh, four and a half full time but I studied the now, then I tried to keep going no, after and I didn't want to care about making any money. Me, I'm the but all of a sudden, I had one year and I okay, chucked so, the idea back. I think it was a good comment. I lost about 25,000. I said, you know what? You know, I think you make a good thing anymore. Just not right. like that. You know, you really I enjoy it. It, it, up, it is a workout. Right. Yeah. Yeah. You've got to do it yourself. It was yeah. so much. Yeah. Yeah. No, no worries. Yeah. They were so restricted. That's kind of bad. All these things that get going, you go down, fly down. Yeah. 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 Boy, you've got personnel sitting I'm around you've got a and you sort of described a couple of years of my life there. <laughs> thankfully, she's the first ever surgery. Mm -hmm. You can just get them and not have to go. Thankfully, forever over there. Yeah. So, so are they closing down? Yeah. Or you're it's already shut. Oh, you shut it down. Yeah, it took me four years to get it going, and it took about a year to close it down. Yeah. Are you guys still good? Yeah, now, yeah. I set up a research center in May. When are you going to make 25 yeah, not quite the history. Yeah. 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 Yeah
reminders next next week we don't have a session we'll be for those going will still be uh, or may still be down in San Diego at the meeting and remember that the session the first session after we come back is a review of the meeting so take some notes because I'll call on some of you to have something prepared and that's also a CME session so you got to make a PowerPoint and Anyway, get some information to me so we can put together a session where four or five of us are speakers. Uh, the other reminder is on uh, Sunday, uh, we got a big turnout. I think 50 people are coming to the dinner that we're sponsoring for ourselves, and 11 are coming to the Teva meeting. So this is a very healthy rebellion against uh, pharma. I'm sorry for you in the back seat, the back <laughs> row, but. Uh, anyway, Frank has got a very adventurous topic here today, understanding how microorganisms, innate immunity, epithelial barrier function, adaptive immunity, and remodeling contribute to the pathophysiology of chronic rhinosinusitis. I'm trying to say that with a yeah, mouthful. <laughs> I like that, Frank. <laughs> All right, well, thanks, uh, Len. Uh, and Len. Obviously, as noticed, I've also taken the liberty to change the title from what was on the schedule. It was meant to be talking about management of severe chronic rhinosinusitis. And the more I thought about it and kind of went through some of this, I realized really not a lot has changed in the last 15 or 20 years. I think we're getting closer, maybe, uh, which is kind of why I shifted the talk here to beginning to understand, and we all know that just from our spectrum of patients, that there are clearly subtypes. It's not quite so simple as, well, you've got polyps and you don't, although that's an important distinction. Clearly, there's a spectrum in terms of severity. We've all seen these patients, for example, that, you know, the ENTs joke, well, the polyps are growing back as you're leaving the OR. And that's about right. Often within a couple months, despite everything we throw at them, uh, they, they continue to have disease. So what I thought I'd do is talk about mainly these five areas and how they might relate to pathophysiology in a specific patient. And sort of the, the mindset here is thinking kind of like Sally Wetzel talking about asthma of these sort of endotypes. And granted, to decipher some of them, you'd probably have to lavage patients or actually do things with their polyps and so forth to get there that maybe in the big picture that might be more successful than ending up with essentially steroids. Uh, really no relevant disclosures. The one disclaimer I have is, as many of you might know, I was involved with the first set of Academy sinusitis practice parameters. Uh, and my disclaimer is that was over 20 years ago. It was a long process, as you can see, almost five years. Really not a lot has changed, I don't think, in terms of approaching the disease but that you know that might be changing even though it's really pretty confusing right now so first a few definitions and I might say sort of as an aside that's really a problem with a lot of studies that's sort of the garbage in garbage out you know you take all comers that have had some sinus complaints for more than 12 weeks 
And depending on what you're studying, you're probably not studying the same group of patients. And so often a lot of therapies might show lukewarm uh, responses where if you could fine tune uh, the group of patients, that might be different. And then the concept of endotypes, uh, again, not just physically looking at the patient, but perhaps biomarkers, response to therapy, aspirin sensitivity, and so forth, that maybe we could uh, further direct therapy. And then we'll talk, as I said, about these five categories as it relates to uh, uh, our understanding of the disease. Again, not the same in every patient. And then I'm going to spend really relatively little time on just talking about diagnosis. In the interest of time, I'm not going to talk about contributing factors such as allergy, immunodeficiency, CF, and so forth. You all kind of know this. Uh, I'm also not going to spend a huge amount of time on medical management, but kind of what I decided to do at the end is put in a bunch of slides that hopefully are sort of a reference. In other words, we'll talk about some various medical therapies, and I've starred the ones where there's sort of a consensus based on the literature uh, and so forth that these are useful things to at least try in patients, and some others that are sort of questionable and then end up by talking about some suggested endotypes. And of course, as usual, the more you understand, the more questions you end up with. So by definition, and I think most people have strayed away from just calling this sinusitis because it really is a continuum with the nose. So we call it rhinosinusitis. Uh, again, by definition, inflammation of the nose and sinuses. And the consensus is you have to have at least two of the following symptoms. Nasal obstruction, uh, which almost all patients have, of course. You may have rhinorrhea, either anterior or posterior. And uh, facial slash sinus pain or pressure. And often these patients, of course the polyp patients, have you know, very little sense of smell. Uh, somewhat arbitrarily, uh, the definitions are acute up to 12 weeks. There are a few things in the literature that attempt to create this third category of subacute, uh, kind of from four to 12 weeks. And really those are patients that failed initial therapy for acute disease. But we're gonna be talking more about chronic disease, uh, uh, which by definition is more than 12 weeks of symptoms. Uh, how common is it? Again, challenging because it depends what you put in your questionnaire. Uh, obviously, but if you loosely just base it on chronic symptoms, uh, a large study in Europe, I believe this was about 1,500 people, uh, felt the prevalence was about 11%. A smaller study in the U.S. felt it was about 12%. And about 40% of these patients uh, have polyps or have had polyps at some point. And as far as current phenotypes, really, Pretty much all we have right now is you've got this patient, they may or may not have had infections, and we sort of subdivide them whether they have polyps or not. But of course, it's not really that simple. And as I said at the beginning, we'll, we'll end up talking or think about this as we go through the concept of fine tuning these groups of patients uh, into perhaps seven, eight, nine, maybe even 10 endotypes. All right, so in the next section, we're going to talk about those five uh, things that relate to pathophysiology. Uh, and uh, again, think about your patients as we talk about this. So first of all, the role of microorganisms. And as we'll see, again, it's not so simple as just causing an infection. In fact, very often, unless you have a patient with a biofilm, these patients really don't necessarily get a lot of infections. But it's more what certain organisms, especially staph, can do beyond creating an infection that can be quite relevant for pathophysiology, and we'll, we'll talk about that in a minute. If you look at what causes acute exacerbations, and it can get tricky to, to tell sometimes if these chronic patients are getting infected, but often you rely on an uptick in degree of symptoms, more purulence, uh, etc., uh, it tends to be the organisms that cause acute disease in patients that don't have chronic disease, 
the Haemophilus moraxella strep pneumonia group, which of course are relevant for middle ear disease and bronchitis. Uh, and in selected patients, for example, patients with cystic fibrosis, uh, pseudomonas, uh, and occasionally staph. And as we'll, we'll come back to that theme, that when uh, researchers have looked at this, it turns out staph, especially if the disease gets more chronic, is at least twice as common in chronic uh, patients as it is in acute disease. Uh, and, and the sort of anecdotal observation that it, it actually seems to help these patients when you add an antibiotic, albeit transiently. In other words, clearly it doesn't cure the problem. It just gets them back to the baseline they were at before they had the acute exacerbation. And then in terms of chronic exacerbations, and often to be fair, because there are not really overnight new symptoms, this concept of biofilms, and we'll, we'll spend a few, probably a good 10 minutes or so talking about biofilms. Uh, and that's these aggregates of bacteria that exist in this kind of web of uh, polysaccharide matrix. And the good news, bad news, uh, as we'll see, is they're much less invasive than they would be sort of as separate bacteria, but become highly resistant for a variety of reasons. And we'll specifically talk about, uh, within these biofilms, how bacteria have mechanisms to go into starvation mode, uh, which, and the relevance of that is a lot of our antibiotics are dependent on these, uh, these bacteria growing, dividing, and so forth. So suddenly, a lot of our antibiotics aren't very useful. If you look at the middle of these biofilms, there's very little blood flow. So the concept of trying to get any meaningful level to the middle of these biofilms is, is very unlikely. So for the next few minutes, uh, and my disclaimer here is I've swiped a few of these slides and modified them a little bit from, from a talk uh, that was given at the recent, recent Western meeting in, in Maui. Uh, and even better, the guy who did this research is actually here at the U. So I sort of contacted him afterwards, and we've uh, gotten him to come next year. And he'll actually give, uh, I, think, uh, I think you'll find him an excellent speaker. So my apologies to Mike Kennedy and Mike Weiss, who were at the, the meeting. So again, as we just talked about, biofilms are this, uh, I sort of think of it as a condominium of, uh, of bacteria that uh, essentially survive in this sort of polymeric matrix. And a couple observations about biofilms, and, and then the concept is that the nature of their growth could explain resistance to killing. So in this uh, diagram, you have an example of sort of free-floating bacteria that are highly sensitive to an aminoglycoside at fairly low concentrations, but then you create conditions where these bacteria form a biofilm, and you can see that even at a thousand times the dose of the antibiotic, you don't get complete killing. So what is it about these biofilms that are unique, and specifically about the bacteria? Well, over the last 20 years, uh, researchers have discovered that there's five attributes that bacteria have to have. And my apologies, it's, it's going to be a little hard to see some of this in the corner here. But the first is uh, something called quorum sensing. And the way to think about this is that the bacteria, it's sort of like the bacteria is on Facebook. And what I mean by that is the bacteria sends out little proteins to its family, and it sends out other little proteins to its friends. And eventually, when the level of these proteins gets high enough, it actually interacts on a receptor on those other bacteria that are present, which then mediates a message to create certain proteins. So, for example, an antiviral protein or, or starting to make a, this uh, cytoskeleton and so forth. So that is a requirement. The second is the production of this uh, exopolysaccharide, and I sort of think of that as kind of a, literally a glue that allows these bacteria to actually clump together. The third uh, is uh, pilus uh, biosynthesis. Let's see where 
Uh, and it's again a little hard to see here, but essentially a pilus is this projection that comes out from the nucleus uh, through the cell wall and even the capsule. And if there's a susceptible friend nearby, this can attach to the friend bacteria and essentially create a tube where, where this bacteria can pass along replicated plasma genetic information and suddenly uh, the new bacteria has the same attribute as the old. And then the final two, one is uh, it's required that these bacteria can uptake iron properly. And then the final one is this concept of two component regulators. Uh, and again, it's a, a pretty hard for you to probably see on this uh, smaller picture. But one example is uh, an enzyme, enzyme called histidine kinase. And essentially these receptors have a component in the cell wall and another component that's in the cytoplasm. And when you get binding to the relevant protein here, it sort of creates this dimer, which then exposes an area that gets phosphorylated. And much like all the other receptors we talked about, then that phosphorus gets transferred to uh, a protein that uh, can create a, a signal to the DNA to produce specific proteins. So these are sort of the basic uh, requirements of these. Yeah, you bet. Do strep only talk to strep, or can no. strep talk to Haemophilus? No, that's that quorum sensing, and uh, you know, they didn't really get into it exactly, but for example, Pseudomonas can talk to strep this way. Uh, in other words, they're, you know, who knows how this actually developed, but the sense is, you know, this guy has something I need. And it's so when you get to a certain level, it creates this message not only to other strep, but, you know, Pseudomonas, for example. So just as a proof of concept, uh, a couple of brief studies uh, suggesting, uh, you know, for example, here's the wild type growing up into a biofilm. And again, there's a mutant in the ability to uptake iron and one that cannot make this exopolysaccharide. And so clearly you don't get aggregation. And then this is an extreme close-up of a biofilm. You see bacteria clumping in here in chronic sinus disease. I'll just whip through these. An example in airway sputum. This is from a cystic fibrosis patient uh, on heart valves, in wounds. You can see these nice little collections of, of bacteria here. So next, it was looking at some observations uh, about this. And so if you look at bacteria growing in this thinnish uh, auger, they sort of grow only in a planktonic way. In other words, they don't form biofilms. But research has observed that if the auger was thicker, and think of it as sort of slowing down potentially the motility of the bacteria, you get biofilm growth. So this led to some consideration that somehow if the bacteria are not able to move as well, there is some signal for them to, to uh, clump into biofilms. And then someone had the idea, well, maybe there's actually something as, in, as infections evolve in us that also has that same effect. And we know, obviously, patients with cystic fibrosis fibrosis uh, not only get infections, but they often get biofilms with pseudomonas. And so somebody took the sputum uh, from CF patients, obviously making sure it was free from bacteria and so forth. And by simply adding it to this thin auger, you could actually get the bacteria to clump. And just again, as a proof of concept, uh, here we have that uh, same uh, study where, again, no biofilm, thicker uh, auger biofilm, but again, uh, if you take a motility mutant, you also get biofilm formation with the thin auger. And sort of the, the, the thought process here is that this does, in fact, contribute to antimicrobial resistance, and you can see that very readily here. Uh, again, if you put the bacteria in the thicker auger, or the motility mute. So this, at least in part, does explain uh, why antibiotics are less effective. And it turns out it's not just 
cobramycin, obviously, you can choose other antibiotics or other things that should help kill bacteria, such as hypochlorous anion uh, peroxide and neutrophils themselves, which of course have both of those. Uh, and again, you can see that these uh, organisms are highly resistant. So at this point, the researchers said, well, you know, there's something about a thicker gel that promotes aggregate formation, uh, and this creates a situation that is highly resistant. So they got to thinking, and, and you know, maybe there's a, th a third thing. If you actually take these bacteria that have these flagella and somehow injure them or actually lop them off, and there is an enzyme in neutrophils that does that, ironically, maybe our own immune system contributes to biofilm formation. And so they sort of targeted this neutrophil elastase in these studies. And what you can see at the bottom here, if I can get my pointer to work, uh, again, wild type, adding CF sputum, but if first you heat and activate the CF sputum, which would, of course, denature a lot of proteins, including neutrophil elastase, you can see that you get biofilm formation. Or you prevent that, I'm sorry. And as a proof of that concept, uh, again, they did the same studies here. And you can see, uh, again, adding the CF sputum, you get biofilm formation. But then if you inhibit elastase, you prevent that from happening. So you have an odd situation where, again, it looks like enzymes that are trying to help from our neutrophils actually may contribute to the formation of biofilms. And again, this is just another study to, to show some evidence for that. Uh, applying Pseudomonas to airway epithelia, and this is looking at transmembrane resistance. So if, if the organism is more invasive, obviously that'll be broken down. And here you can see if the organisms are treated with the supernatant, they actually stay in biofilms and are not invasive, uh, whereas if you heat treat the supernatant, they become like good old-fashioned pseudomonas, and they're quite invasive. As a final proof of concept, they actually picked on some poor mice uh, and put a wound on their back with pseudomonas on it, and again, you can see if you apply CF sputum to the area, these mice did much better than if you heat and activate sputum. So the traditional model was, and there's still an element of truth there, that perhaps you could target some of the attributes of biofilm bacteria, such as using a detergent to disrupt the, the exopolysaccharide uh, and so forth, but an alternative model is maybe there's some way we can alter the host conditions to actually prevent this biofilm from forming. All right, so just keep that in mind. And then a second consideration, which we'll talk about, has to do with starvation mode. And if you look at these biofilms, and this is a very uh, elegant picture showing that it's easy to kill the bugs around the edge, but these organisms in the, resist in the middle are highly resistant. And uh, we know, for example, that there are gradients of uh, things that are required. For example, in the middle of the biofilm, there's hardly any oxygen. And also, in a relative sense, uh, the uh, organisms in the middle are in starvation mode. So the researchers sort of looked at what if there is some way we could fool the bacteria? Uh, in other words, these ones that are starved, what if they don't know that they're starved? Maybe then they won't go into this sort of dormant state. And so the, the model here uh, is to sort of mimic amino acid starvation. Uh, they used an analog of serine, which if present essentially uh, pulse the machinery here, and when that happens, much like uh, if the amino acids were deficient, the bacteria produce this polyphosphated guanine, which they call an alarmone, which essentially is a signal to the cell to, you know, basically go into starvation mode, and hence potentially, you know, not dividing and so forth. 
and that alone increasing the chance of, of being resistant. Uh, and so they did uh, some experiments here, uh, essentially uh, taking these bacteria, and the concept was if we can fool the bacteria when we starve them, that they don't know they're starving, maybe they'll be more susceptible to killing. And that's exactly what was found. So uh, in this experiment, here is a wild type who's growing very nicely. You add an antibiotic, very quite effective. But then if you first add this serine analog, which creates this starvation alarm on, you can see they're much more resistant to the antibiotic. Now, if you take a starvation sensing mutant, in other words, it really lacks receptors for that polyphosphated guanine, you can see although the end result is similar, uh, these, these organisms are much more resistant to the, uh, sorry, much more sensitive to the antibiotic. So in, in summary, we've talked a little bit about biofilms uh, and the concept that ironically our own immune system may add to the predilection for bacteria to, uh, to, to actually form these biofilms. And so the next step in the research is to try to perhaps create clever ways to fool these bacteria by uh, creating a milieu, perhaps with a medication, uh, that makes them not realize they should go into starvation mode. Frank, what yeah. is the evidence that, or maybe you're going to get into this, that the biofilms are present in, in the noses of people who have sinus disease? Yeah, again, literally at the time of surgery, uh, these are, you know, patients, and often, to be fair, they end up at surgery for other reasons. Uh, you actually see these collections of, of so bacteria. Correct. Yeah, kind of like that first, I know that was a really close yeah. electron micrograph, but yeah, this is literally what you see at surgery. You think we would see that on a nasal smear? Yeah, that's it. Not that I'm aware of. Yeah. I, I think, again, it's probably really too deep. Mm for you to physically see it. I don't know if, De Paul, do you do rhinoscopy or? No, I have, yeah. I have a tremor and I used to scare patients. I swear. <laughs> you threaten them with surgery. But I was just going to ask if you think this is the reason why when the surgical cultures go down to the lab, they usually see normal respiratory flora and they won't yes. use any specific organisms. And they, yeah. like in aspergillus, I mean, you get this gelatinous mess and it looks horrible. And you culture it and you get like a couple strep and a couple staph and that's all. So it's exactly... Yeah. And it may, it may well be that you're really not getting an adequate sample in the middle of that blob. In other words, the ones around the end are, are dead. And so you're right, you get what you get in our notes. So it's not very helpful. Frank, since these bacteria are basically resting, they're not, not growing, how are they pathogenic even though they're there? How are they playing? Well, that's, that's a, that's a, no, that's a fair that. point. And actually, kind of the point is we'll talk about, especially like with staph, they aren't terribly. It's almost like a symbiotic relationship. But because of other things that, like at least staph, for example, has been implicated in creating this local, uh, through its endotoxins and so forth, this polyclonal IgE response, uh, kind of altering adaptive and innate immunity and so forth, that it, it actually may contribute to the pathophysiology of everything else. In other words, the polyps. And, and that, that's what you get the morbidity from. And, and, and the eosinophil load, which, you know, is probably in parallel with the asthma load, you know, that sort of thing. But you're absolutely right. They really aren't creating a lot of, you know, invasive disease. So a, a, a very frustrating situation. Let's see where we're at. Time All right, so a couple more things about uh, microorganisms uh, and specifically about staph. And as I mentioned, if you study patients who have had this not just for 12 weeks, but uh, often some of these studies are in patients with you know over six months of chronic illness, staph is a very common thing that's observed. Uh, but to Len's point, and not in an invasive way, it's just there. Uh, and it has been noted that uh, patients that have staph have a lot more eosinophils than sort of patients that don't. Uh, 
uh, and these are present uh, almost universally in patients with polyps. Uh, these organisms can form biofilms. We've just talked about that. They also can penetrate the mucosa and actually are clever enough to live in cells uh, and therefore avoid uh, bacteria, uh, antibiotic therapy as well. Uh, as we'll see, it can initiate a Th2-like response through exo and endotoxins. Uh, and this response, of course, is associated with the usual lymphokines we associate with a Th2 response. And ironically, that actually compromises the immune response to staph. And as we'll talk about, these toxins can also initiate a polyclonal IgE response, sort of bridging by activating antigen-presenting cells and T-cell receptors in a polyclonal way, uh, can not only create an IgE response, but because they downregulate transforming growth factor beta actually impair the production of T-regulatory cells as well. And again, I won't bore you with the details, but I put in a few of these slides just to know that, you, so you'll know I'm not just making this all up. Uh, so this is one of the studies from Klaus Bockert's group. And what you can see here, so this is uh, on the right are the nasal polyp patients, and you can see this uptick in the Th2 sort of phenotype, and then this downshift in transforming growth factor beta. We'll talk about that in just a minute. Uh, this is a, a little bit of a confusing slide, but I just kind of threw it in. And this was also from Klaus Bockert's group in Belgium. And showing, uh, and when it's talking about severe, it's talking about degree of asthma here. So it's showing a correlation with odds ratios. If, if you actually have, and this is actually in the serum as well as in the nose, if you have uh, IgE, uh, to staph uh, uh, toxins. Sorry, this is not cooperating. There we go. Uh, so patients that are positive, we know, for example, that if you have IgE to a perennial allergen like house dust mites, obviously your risk of having asthma is greater. But you can see it's even greater in these patients that have IgE to staph endotoxin. Uh, if you compare severe asthma with control patients without asthma, the odds ratio is even much higher. Uh, this is kind of an interesting observation that if you're grass allergic as well, in a relative sense, it reduces the risk. And the authors didn't really comment about that. I'm, maybe the concept is that your, you know, your immune mechanism is dealing with these other seasonal allergens, so it has a less vigorous response to the staph. I'm not sure, but the point is you can see that clearly there's a relationship between having IgE to these staph toxins and degree of asthma. Now, is that just an epiphenomenon or really true? Uh, hard to know. So does that suggest that immunotherapy to your own bacteria might be helpful? Yeah, that's a good question. Days? Uh, that's a good question. No, but as we'll talk about as it relates to the IgE, I'll show you, and it is just one study, but it's a pretty impressive study using omalizumab, and, and it's more relating to the polyclonal IgE response. Uh, as I'll show you, it's almost not believable, but uh, that's a, a disclaimer. And, and they didn't hand pick the patients either. When you went through this, did you see that the same staff that caused bad eczema with the, thought the IgE against yes. the staff? Are yep. these the same staff organisms that yes. end up in your nose? Exactly, and you'll see a lot of, think of Dr. Burnett's talk a few weeks ago, a lot of similar themes there. And also think about chronic asthma, a lot of similar themes, but exactly. In fact, one of the, if you look back here, you'll see that uh, one of the, sorry, I missed it. Yeah, the, the top uh, reference here actually speaks to this, but it's actually from Donald Leung's group. Uh, and it's, it is the very same organisms. So- uh, For the younger people in the room is, Decades ago, allergies used to give immunotherapy as bacterial extracts. Bacterial. No real data, and then those products were pulled for the market because there was no efficacy. No. That, you know, and this was sort of an unregulated business that used to be done. But it's an interesting, yeah. interesting thought. So just briefly, and uh, uh, 
And as was noted, you can see again a relationship here with, and these are polyp patients, much like patients with bad chronic uh, atopic dermatitis, a decrease in a variety of uh, chemicals that have antibacterial effects including psoriasin, it's hard to say, and something called PLUNK, which stands for palate lung nasal epithelial clone, uh, and it's involved with uh, interfering uh, or involved with uh, antimicrobial defense, and then blunted responses from some of the TLRs, and interestingly enough, uh, blunt uh, in STAT3 signaling much like hyper, some hyper IgE patients get. And let me just, again, we won't kind of bore you with all the details here, but you can see this is looking at this plunk uh, molecule, and you can see the patients with polyps. Uh, this is very underrepresented, and you can see that visually here. So this is controls chronic patients without polyps, chronic patients with polyps, but in their uncinate process versus, versus in the polyps of themselves. And then this is looking at psoriasin, uh, again, a molecule that has antibacterial properties. And you can see uh, patients that have polyps. This is very underrepresented. Interestingly enough, a lot like patients with allergy, or severe patients with allergy. And on the right here, you can see very similar to what I showed you before. Here's polyp tissue, uh, and staining for psoriasis is brown. You can see there's virtually none, in contrast to a normal uncinate process and sort of non-polyp tissue in, 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 in patients. You can see at least some staining. And then I mentioned uh, uh, decreased production of TLR2. Uh, and I just, for reference, put here what those TLRs re respond to. Uh, TLR5, TLR7, and TLR9. So, and the, you know, the, the question here is, how does that happen? And obviously it's no one has a great answer for that, but the observation is that this milieu, uh, by definition, is more likely to lead to a recurrent or chronic infection. Another observation in the innate immune responses, and this is also in patients with polyps, is that IL-6 is increased, although, as you can see in this study, it looks like it was mainly a few outliers here. And these are the effects of that increase in IL-6. And it's observed that uh, STAT-3 is also decreased uh, in polypoid tissue. Uh, and the authors point out the potentially a localized uh, hyper syndrome syndrome-like uh, phenotype. Uh, and that is exactly what's observed. In other words, more risk for staph lots of EOs and local IgE production. So a third component is the sort of destruction of the epithelial barrier. And again, think in terms of bad atopic dermatitis or uh, you know, think of asthma as an epithelial barrier disease as well. Uh, this is just a reminder about the components of these tight junctions and what happens if they are deficient and if you uh, look at patients with chronic sinus disease, you do indeed find that the uh, relevant protein messengers are decreased that will lead to, the, to the, the proteins that are involved in forming these tight junctions uh, and that the epithelial resistance is in fact decreased as well. And this is again in patients with polyps versus those without or normals. It turns out that if interferon or IL-4 is around, which is usually the case, this gets even worse. Uh, and because of some other uh, attributes uh, of staph, actually T cells are less likely to die and they actually get jazzed up. So you get the situation where they actually promote more inflammation and these activated epithelia in the presence of interferon, which as I said is universally there, uh, 
and in the presence of FAS uh, and its ligand and TRAIL, this stands for TNF-related apop apoptosis-inducing ligand, leads to death of the epithelial cells. And this, this next slide, which is, again, a little hard to see, uh, just as a proof of concept or showing what's going on here. So this first uh, greenish stain is something called tunnel, which stands for this. And what it does is it binds to DNA that's been nicked. So as the cells are dying and so forth, the DNA degrades, it actually, and you can see that in the chronic rhinosinusitis patients, this lighting up around the periphery here. And DAPI is a, this bluish item here, which actually binds to, to double-stranded DNA. Uh, and uh, again, as the cells are sort of falling apart, it requires kind of an intact uh, membrane and a DNA to bind. You can see in a relative sense there's less staining here. So essentially what you're looking at is cells that are already dead, pretty much, and ones that are about to die. And this diagram on the right, I apologize, it's a little small, a little hard to see. But as, as a proof of concept here, if you look, you can see that uh, interferon itself has an effect, but it requires, of course, the other uh, pathways, in other words, FAS and TRAIL, to lead to this cell death. So again, another situation where, because the barrier is destroyed, you have another reason to get chronic infections. We just talked about, again, similarities to moderate to severe asthma and atopic dermatitis. And also, uh, ironically, you have a reduction in all of these components that either ward off bacteria or are important for repairing epithelia. And this, again, is just in brief a study that shows what I just wrote. Uh, and you can see that in chronic sinus patients, psoriasin, again, is decreased. Uh, as well as a number of these other protective uh, proteins, uh, uh, SPINK5, uh, Dr. Burnett talked about a few weeks ago, again, relevant for Netherton syndrome and so forth, again, decreased in polyp patients. <coughs> All right, a couple more things. Uh, as far as the adaptive immune response, and we kind of alluded to this uh, uh, a few minutes ago, that if you have the presence of staph and its toxins, very often you get high levels of not only specific IgE to staph, but a polyclonal IgE response. And this can occur, in fact, two thirds of the time in patients that otherwise you wouldn't consider a top. In other words, you skin test them to dust my grass, the usual thing, or do serum testing, you'd guess this is not an atopic person. But if you actually look in the polypoid tissue, you'd guess otherwise. Uh, and this has been linked to staph. Uh, and uh, that level of tissue IgE, much like an allergic patient, it's very much linked to asthma severity. So as a proof of concept, this is Bockert's group again. This is the Zoller study I was alluding to earlier. They actually took these patients, and again, they didn't hand pick them or actually measure, which is probably unfortunate, but they didn't measure the amount of IgE up here. Just took baseline polyp scores and so forth, and then kind of put them on the asthma uh, diagram for what the Zolair dosing would be. In other words, uh, and to be fair, you know, this was based on some of these patients weren't very atopic. So, if anything, they got a relatively lower dose maybe than they might have benefited from uh, uh, over a four-month uh, period of time. And this, just for reference, uh, is how they did the polyp scarring, uh, four being the, the worst it gets. In other words, this patient sort of had surgery six months ago. Uh, and what was impressive, as you can see, at the end of the study in the Zoller patients, the change in that score was almost three. And to begin with, the score was nearly four in, in these patients. So a huge reduction in uh, polyp score, CT score, nasal asthma symptoms, 
other secondary things were a standard health questionnaire, a rhinitis questionnaire, an asthma questionnaire, and they looked at some biomarkers. But fairly impressive, but not approved. Uh, the other observation, and I talked about this a couple years ago uh, when we were talking about journals, this is from Bob Schleimer's group at Northwestern, is the observation that if you actually stain this polypoid tissue, you often get staining for autoantibodies. And so the question is like, well, so, I mean, is that really relevant uh, uh, for pathophysiology? Who knows? But it's definitely linked to the presence of this BAF factor, which I mentioned, and also to increased levels of these chemoattractants. And then another point uh, that the authors have made, if you actually study what's going on in the nose, about 80% of these polyp patients have this TH2-like phenotype, and much like highly atopic patients uh, have the demographics mentioned here. Another group have this sort of non, not really a TH1 phenotype exactly, but a non-TH2 phenotype with these hemokines and cells. And then there are other patients that have a, a, a gamish. In other words, they've got all of it. Probably have sort of two different things going on. And then even these other phenotypes in some patients. But these are more rare. And so with the thought that a high percentage of these patients, and we all see these patients all the time, and if you actually do a nasal smear, uh, you know, EOs are going off onto the floor. There's so many of them. So the proof of concept here was actually using a monoclonal against uh, IL-5. Uh, and this was actually just a two-dose study. Uh, again, and a requirement for this study is you had to have a grade three to four polyp, same criteria as the Zolaire study. Uh, uh, and here you can see, uh, maybe you can see, it's a little hard to see, but here the, the changes were a little more modest. Again half the duration of the study is the Zolaire study and obviously a different agent. Here the change was a little over one versus the Zolaire study where it was almost three. But another potential thing that, you know, might be useful in some of these patients. All right, and finally, I'm going to say a couple words about structural changes. Uh, and just if you look at these patients with polyp formation, you find this sort of pattern decreases, as I mentioned, in transforming growth factor, which is important for converting sort of regular T cells to T regulatory cells. A decrease in the inhibitors of metalloproteinases, decrease in collagen, a decrease in FOXP3 expression, and initially a decrease in IL-32, but late in the game that actually changes and it actually increases. And then sort of the typical findings you'd expect with remodel. So again, some analogies to asthma. And I won't go over this, but just, just to show you, that the authors have sort of tried to subdivide the differences in polyp and non-polyp patients as it relates to remodel. And again, we don't have, I just put these, this is meant to be sort of a summary of the last 40 minutes. So if you go through this slide, you'll see I, I kind of wrote on the side and circled what's relevant in, in the relationship in these patients with polyps. And then the second slide is in patients that don't have polyps. And the concept is in the first group, more of a TH2-like response, eosinophils in the second group, potentially more of a TH1 or zero response in neutrophils. All right, we'll spend the last few minutes, and uh, most of these I put in just for completeness and reference. Again, we talked at the beginning about a consensus definition uh, here, uh, the requirement at least of two of these symptoms, and ultimately some objective evidence of sinus disease. In other words, this is not just a patient who actually is having just rhinitis, but actually proving with rhinoscopy or imaging that they actually have sinus disease. So the next few slides I'm just going to show you, this is a consensus document, sort of 
uh, it's mainly it was actually printed in the European literature, uh, but a consensus group from some people in the U.S. And I asterisk those items that are felt to be objectively useful. So including nasal saline, obviously we all use intranasal steroids, either to try to downregulate the disease or after surgery to, uh, to create a situation which is less likely to be recurrent. Uh, systemic antibiotics, as I mentioned earlier, sort of have mixed reviews. Uh, in other words, you, obviously in these patients, if really nothing has changed, clearly imaging procedures and so forth are fraught with being nonspecific. These patients often have extensive mucosal thickening as opposed to a patient who was totally well a week ago, then those changes might need something. But in these patients, it's really not useful. So the authors make the point, unless you have a strong clinical suspicion or you actually endoscopically get a culture that you feel is meaningful, it's really not predictably helpful. Frank, have they um, taken a look at what processes the steroids actually inhibit when you get these cells out and you have all these different um, immunomodulators and that picture that you had with like 500 things on it, have they yeah. looked at what steroids actually do to... Well, not, not ultimately. I mean, obviously, you know, from a functional perspective, kind of to Len's point, obviously, really what you're trying to do is shrink down the process that's leading to the polyps and sort of debulk the eosinophilic response, but not exactly. They really haven't. So yeah. it, just, it just kills the eosinophils and that's the operating mode that we have now. Well, you're going to, you know, prudential, you certainly block the, that, those, uh, you know, cytokines from being produced. Because the uh, surgeons used to inject the polyps with steroids. I don't know if they yeah. still do that anymore. Oh, yeah. Yeah. In outlying communities. Outlying. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, you do, you do still, you do still see that, definitely. Uh, obviously, I think we all use systemic steroids, and this is a somewhat arbitrary, uh, you know, recipe for doing that, but I think not unreasonable. Uh, just out of curiosity in the room, how, uh, how many people use sort of solutions? I know Paul does solutions of steroids in these patients. In other words, like budesonide, respules, or, uh, yeah. That sounds like almost everyone at least tries it. Do you think they're successful? They shrink polyps for yeah. sure. You can yeah. save people from going to surgery. Yeah, or at least de at least defray it until they give up doing it. Yeah, no, I would agree. So this, again, and I put a couple references here to show that that is objectively true. But the reality is you would think these patients might be highly motivated, but after a while, and this, these were, of course, studies, patients sort of feel better for a while, and then they stop doing it, and then it gets to that you know, over the edge state where, you know, you're not going to get get it up there, I think, adequately. Topical antibiotics, also mixed reviews. Uh, I think a lot of us certainly try mucuricin solutions in some of these patients, you know, that don't have extreme polyps. And, you know, it may or may not be helpful. Uh, the risk of ototoxicity is pointed out here, and this is obviously mainly in CF patients. Um, Again, just out of curiosity, does anybody use like Sinunebs or? I haven't tried that myself. But, uh, there is a body of literature supporting that that could be useful, although this was mainly post op. It, you know, again, sort of the prophylactic idea once you can actually hopefully get farther out into the tissues as opposed to trying to put a dent in the severe disease. Remember when John Lynch, the ID guy, was here, we asked him specifically, and certainly he felt from an ID point of view there was no efficacy in yeah. intranasal antibiotics. Yeah. I mean, and just intuitively, especially if there's obstruction, it's pretty tough to reach where you need to get, probably. Uh, I just throw this in, which it's kind of an interesting thing. Clearly there was some headbutting here, but this was a European study that the Europeans thought was a good study, and they've actually put it in their algorithms that this is something you should do before you call somebody a medical failure. And I think the concept was the anti-inflammatory effect of macrolides. And then in this study, they, they treated these patients for three months, or they did surgery, and then they looked at the difference at six to 12 months. And 
and there really didn't, didn't find a significant difference, which perhaps I think speaks to the recurrence rate of polyps. And the other bad part about this study is there was really no sham events done, and I can understand why. But also, after the first 12 weeks, you were allowed to do what you thought you needed to do. So it was kind of like, well, these patients got erythromycin for three months, but he looks pretty bad. We'll give him some oral steroids. And so suddenly you're really not comparing the two things fairly, is my point. And it was kind of interesting because Dan Hamelos wrote, and there was a great article, and I'll show you that in a second. And he specifically, he mentions the European consensus paper, but leaves this out of his, uh, clearly he's made the determination that it was not a great study. So I just, you'll see that if you look at European guidelines. Uh, leukotrienes, either as monotherapy or add-on therapy, some modest benefit. Uh, I think they're knowing that the, the pathophysiology in, involved, I, I think this certainly is reasonable in, in patients who have AERD. Uh, it's unclear from studies if Zylutens is, is a better choice than, say, Montelukast or Zafirlukast. Uh, aspirin desensitization, as you all know, is it's a useful thing if the patient is indeed sensitive to aspirin. Uh, and there, I point out that there's a study, uh, which Jennifer Lee may have mentioned when she talked, but from about six years ago, showing that if the patients really had a good response at 650 twice a day over a year, you really can decrease the dose. In other words, they either kept some patients on or decreased the dose, and, and they found equal control with a little less risk of long-term side effects. So you can kind of try to make some clinical determination about that, although no one has really said, well, how long should you do that? Uh, allergy, obviously, is intuitively makes sense to take any eosinophilic component out of the equation that you can. There's certainly no controlled studies on immunotherapy, and obviously I think they'd be fraught with a lot of uh, uh, you know, heterogeneity of patients. This I put in from Dan Hamelos' paper. Just, again, you can take a look at it. It's an algorithm that he suggests, and I think he's a pretty straight shooter, uh, of how to approach patients without polyps. Uh, and I, I've sort of synthesized some of that here. You know, if the disease is mild and non prevalent obviously trying to see where the patient goes with simple lavage and suppression. Uh, if there is more of a prevalent component, uh, treating for suspected infections, possibly using oral steroids. And then if it's persistent, obviously imaging, possibly considering immune evaluation depending on their story. And ultimately at some point, and he uses 12 weeks, calling that a medical failure if the patient isn't getting better. For recurrent disease, you know, I think it's a fair statement that and this all assumes that you've maybe looked at if the patient has allergy and so forth. Uh, but if, you know, if they don't have allergy and their anatomy looks fine, it certainly then raises immunodeficiency on the radar, uh, even though that's less common. And then for patients with polyps, uh, again, attacking them initially probably with oral steroids to try to debulk things and then perhaps trying these solutions. Again, if there's a hint of purulence, uh, considering antibiotics or perhaps empirically targeting staph, although the caveat there is often this is going to be in a biofilm. So is that really useful? I suppose it's worth a try. And again, much like the prior patients, it's persistent scanning them and, and obviously getting polyps out of there. And then after surgery, you know, <coughs> considering glucotrine modifiers, especially if the patient's aspirin sensitive and considering aspirin desensitization. So it leaves us sort of with this, and this is just from Sesme Actus's paper uh, from last year where a lot of this is, is from, this concept of, you know, the phenotypes of polyps or not, but clearly perhaps starting to define some of these uh, endotypes uh, and maybe targeting therapy. And he's sort of throwing out some examples of potential ways of defining these endotypes. And of course that leaves us with 
you know, lots of questions. So, so with that, I'll stop. I, I happened to come across this. This is kind of a uh, interesting thing. Uh, this this woman from Stanford talked about a niche job. She has a PhD in botany and micro micro microbial engineering and also is an expert in variable pressure scanning electron microscopy. So she went to this conference in Wales and saw this six foot tall stone hand and then overlaid uh, a scanning electron micrographs of biofilms on the hand. So <laughs> this is meant to be how, how yucky your hand is. <laughs> With that, I'll, I'll stop. Frank, is this... Um Tangential, but does this help us understand eosinophilic non-allergic rhinitis? Um, is any of this? Inspired? Yeah, I think. Yeah, I mean, you know, as you know, uh, the, you know, the ENT people at Mayo have said, oh, it's due to a fungal component, and then subsequent research, even by their own admission, shows that you know that wasn't a lot more common than controls, and is perhaps an epiphenomenon. I guess the other way to spin that is. Who knows? Maybe there's sort of a, again a, an effect of fungi that's relevant here. But I think what this literature is suggesting is that staff may be playing a very important role in certainly accelerating polyp formation and in this notion of IgE being present. So I haven't seen any others. I don't know if anyone else has come across any other studies with omalizumab or actually lavaging these patients to say, yeah. Here's a marker. These patients have buckets of IgE, whether they're atopic or not, and actually doing a zolar trial. Well, are there so. people who are atopic but uh, not in the periphery, who only have either lung or nasal atopic disease? Mm -hmm. That's been a theme recently. Yes. Do yes. sort of uh, you think that's true? I don't know, but ADPA suggests that, that almost all your IgE is in the airway. And that's, you know, that's the suggestion here, and that, that that is, in fact, you know, not a separate, this is not somebody who's engineered to be a topic, but it's specifically engineered by staff and, and what the toxins do. Uh, so, you know, you would think there might be a maybe early on in disease a way that you could, you know, try to target staff, prevent the biofilms from forming. So does anything break up the biofilms, a uh, baby shampoo? Well, yeah, that's the theory is that it, it helps destroy the exo exoskeleton sort of matrix there. But at least everything that I've seen, it's sort of underwhelming. And I and like a lot of things, it probably depends on when you start doing it. And you know, if the disease is far gone, you're sort of just hitting the tip of the iceberg. And the macrolide class of antibiotics has been shown to break down biofilms, but it's the only class of antibiotics that works to do that. I'm not sure why. But the other, has anybody tried treating these chronic resistant staph people with rifampin? I mean, we have a great staph drug that yeah, penetrates no. everything. But I don't see, I have not seen any literature on rifampin in these chronic people. Yeah, no, I have not either. Gary, anything? No, I'm, I'm, I question whether it works. Obviously, the antibiotics have been around for years, and the types of antibiotics don't work uh, for all of these patients. I, I'm convinced that the patients that have eosinophils, and you're going to make that diagnosis with your nasal smear, the vast majority have non-allergic eosinophilic rhinitis, they're going to respond to antibiotics. The ones that don't have, that are neutrophil driven, they don't respond uh, to anything. They don't even respond to antibiotics. Did I say antibiotics? I meant steroids. Sure. To steroids. The others don't respond to anything. So I, I'm not convinced that antibiotics play a major role unless they have a secondary acute uh, infectious process on top of their chronic sinus. Exactly. What, what about other? Which is hard to tell. You know, yeah. I give a lot of cyclosporin to a lot of people for things where it's not indicated. <laughs> but, but I've been convinced that it clearly helps these people that they have a chronic inflammatory disease. And you can't keep them on steroids forever. Yeah. Any, well, the other you know thing, which is you know, it's that double-edged sword. Yeah. But, yeah. You know, every, I'd say once a decade, I see a patient that, you know, you hit them hard with the oral steroids, and to be fair, they're not awful to begin with, but everything stops. And you sort of get the feeling that if we treated these patients long enough, the systemic steroids, you might be able to, you know, not only shrink everything down, but stop that sort of vicious cycle. But understandably, we don't because of risk of side effects and so forth. 
Um, so it, I, I don't know. I, w I would think a lot of these patients would benefit from anti-IL-5. And certainly this study suggests maybe omalizumab too. So, all right. I know, uh, I'm sure the Genentech people are uh, going to be at this meeting, pretty sure they're going to get approval for uh, Zolaire for chronic urticaria. Right. I don't know if they're doing any funded studies to look at it for chronic rhinosinusitis. Not, not that I, I have seen, although that I did that thing for Journal Club too, looking at unapproved uses of Momalizumab, and there was nothing. This was probably six years ago. But now, you know, but that study was right after that, so it's kind of interesting. Are there studies that show that surgery makes a difference? I, I mean, transiently. Yeah, that's my but, impression. I'm, maybe you know, I'm just seeing all the failures, but they're just back with what they had before. Yes. And they're still getting infected. There's one surgery which is a total ethmoidectomy with mucosal stripping, and the only person who will do that is Weimuller. Nobody else will even touch that surgery now. Yeah. But that's been the only one that's been shown to prevent recurrence. Yeah. It's recurrence of what? Surgery. You mean of sinus, uh, sinus infections? Yeah, polyps. Because okay. once the mucosa is gone, theoretically, you can't make a polyp anymore. So. Right. But that's a, he's the only surgeon who does well, it. Really he Chu used it. to do that, too. He doesn't do it anymore either. Well, maybe he's retired. That's probably why. Well, he's, he's, but he won't do that surgery only. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, but I'm just convinced kind of it comes different. back. Even, I even wonder about those. I think they all come back. Well, and, you know, that new device, the steroid, the, the surgeons are using that steroid eluding right. stent that I mentioned. Right. At least oh, yeah. while it's in there for about six weeks, and they can play. What they want to do is... Now they only have approval to put it in the OR, but they want to be able to put it in repeatedly as an outpatient procedure. That might be useful. I mean, right. the data that I saw looked it's promising. Your name like always. I mean, it's sort of, you get the sense, though, that the message is still way out here, you know, or way up here, and, you know, you're not going to reach that with lavage or a stamp. You might defray the inevitable, though. It all comes Did back. you read anything in, about the why the doxycycline shrinks polyps? Yes. And, yeah, that's and, another thing that's actually in the European algorithm. Except we can't get doxycycline for four dollars now; it's four hundred dollars <laughs> again. Nice. So. Yeah. There, there was because the company that makes the generic realized nobody was buying the name brand stuff, so they quit making the generic. <laughs> Is that what oral doxy or are you topically? No, oral, oral doxycycline oral. shrinks polyps. Yeah. Independent of steroids or anything else, but it's the only drug that does that. Yeah. But it gets staff. That's why I'm wondering. So you wonder if it's a it's a exactly. second mechanism there. Yeah. And those were the people that did the study. It was the Belgium group. Well, when Frank asked if any were using uh, budesonide, we actually, after Mike's encouragement, have people laying upside down and fill their nose up with yeah. budesonide. Yeah. Works incredibly well, but they they have to be super motivated. Yes. And as soon as they get better, they all slack off, and then they all come back as soon as they stop. The way it works well if you get them to do it. How much do you use? You know, three you or four cc's in, in each yeah. nostril. Put in a milligram a day. Yeah, it's yeah. volume dependent. As their polyps shrink, they put in more. So, but they have to stay upside down so it doesn't just go down the throat. And you can actually you can follow the size of their polyps by how much medicine it takes to fill up their nose. I have them do it just with a squirt bottle because most people won't lay upside right. down; they get dizzy. It seems yeah. to work that way as well. That Mike gave up on the upside down stuff. And he has to just spray it fifteen or twenty times a day up there. That's what I do. Yeah. But it's an open field, that's for sure. That's right. That's a great review, Frank. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thanks.